What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? Our subject this morning is life's most dreaded appointments. Now when I say that today, you might think immediately of an appointment that you have with a lawyer. You might think of an appointment that you have with a, of a, a dentist. I, I hate going to the dentist. Or you might think of your appointment as I did this week. I had my appointment with my gastroenterologist. You know, I just turned 50 a few years ago, and actually two years ago, and they've been bugging me for two years. You know what you're supposed to do at 50? At 50, you're supposed to do that dreaded colonoscopy, and I've been putting it off forever. And so this week, I had that dreaded appointment. I'm thankful that I passed with flying colors. They gave me a 10-year warranty, and I'm doing really well right there, okay, as some of you. But that's not the appointment that we're talking about this morning. Without a doubt, life's most dreaded event, life's most dreaded appointment is one that every single one of us have here today. And I'm speaking, of course, of our death. Let me give you just a few facts of death before we read our passage this morning. They say, I thought this was interesting, they say that in all of human history, 100 billion people have died. Now, I tried to do the math. My mind is not big enough to go to those numbers, but that's what uh, statisticians tell us, that 100 billion people have died in all of human history. I thought this was interesting. It might not have much to do with the message, but I thought it was interesting. They say that when a person dies, the last sense that they lose is their sense of hearing. I thought that was so cool because when you and I are with a loved one on their deathbed, we're speaking to them and and we're trying to communicate with them. And if that's true, as they say, that, that last sense that they lose, that last ability is the ability to hear. They say that 80% of the people in the United States die in the hospital. I'm not sure whether that's true, but it sure makes me realize one thing. Don't go to the hospital, right? If I never go to the hospital, I don't have to worry about being in that 80%. They say left-handers, let me ask, how many left-handers do we have in the building today? I'm actually raising my left hand, but I'm a right-hander. Left-handers, they say left-handers die three years earlier than right-handers. If you're left-handed, learn how to write with that right hand. You never know. It might extend your life just a little bit. They say that 35 million cells die in your body and mine every single minute. Every minute, 35 million cells in our body is dying. Now we realize that our body reinvents itself and it's continually making cells as well. But but every minute we have cells that are dying. Someone have said, I'm not sure how true it is biologically. I know it's true spiritually to a certain degree. Someone have said that from the moment we're born, we begin to die. And from the moment we're born, we begin facing that ultimate appointment, the appointment called death. It was George Bernard Shaw that made the now famous statement, the statistics of death are quite impressive. One out of every one person dies. And so today, each and, uh, each and every one of us have an appointment. So as we continue with our study on the book of Ecclesiastes, here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Solomon gives us an under-the-sun perspective on death. We're going to begin in Ecclesiastes 9 and we're going to end in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as we see the New Testament parallel with that. But notice with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 beginning in verse 1. I'll read it out of the New Living Translation. You can follow along on the screen or the Bible that you have in your hand. Solomon says this, this too I carefully explored. 
Even though the actions of godly and wise people are in God's hand, hands, no one knows whether God will show them favor. You're my, you, your version might read that just a little different. We'll make reference to it in just a moment. Verse 2, the same destiny ultimately awaits everyone, whether righteous or wicked, whether good or bad, ceremonially clean or unclean, righteous or irreligious, good people receive the same treatment as sinners. And people who make promises to God or who make oaths or vows are treated like people who don't. Verse 3, it seems so tragic that everyone under the sun suffers the same fate. That is why people are not more careful to be good. Instead, they choose their own mad course. Remember that he's talking from an under the sun perspective. For they have no hope. There is nothing ahead but death anyway. Notice verse 4. There is hope only for the living. As they say, it is better to be a live dog than a dead lion. The living at least know they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, nor are they remembered. Whatever they did in their lifetime, loving, hating, envying, is all gone. They no longer play a part in anything here on the earth. Wow, pretty gloomy passage of scripture that Solomon reads for us today, yet something that each and every one of us this morning need to be reminded of. Remember that Solomon is pursuing. Solomon is in the midst of a pursuit. He's in the midst of a chase. He's looking for meaning in life. He's looking for significance. And in the midst of this search, in the midst of this pursuit, he's ruled out things that he's already experienced. He's ruled out success. He's ruled out intellectualism. He's ruled out pleasure. He's ruled out wealth. He's ruled out riches. He's ruled out all of those things, see, saying meaning is not found in any of those things. Why all of those things are nothing more than vanity. And as we've talked about previously, the book of Ecclesiastes is an Old Testament track that shows the futility of life and shows that the answer, the only answer, is found in the person of Jesus Christ. So this morning I want us to see two simple yet profound truths before we partake of the Lord's Supper today. The first is this, death is a reality of life. Death is a reality of life. I want you to notice because it's significant how Solomon ends the previous chapter. I'd remind you in our Bibles we have chapter divisions and verse divisions but it wasn't originally written that way. One thought flowed into the next and so notice the last verse of chapter 8 and notice what Solomon says. He said, I realize that no one can discover everything God is doing under the sun. Not even the wisest people discover everything, no matter what they claim. You see, this morning, no matter how intelligent, wise, or astute you and I are, there are things about God, there are things about God's working in our lives that we can never understand. They're a mystery to us. We try to understand them. But as Solomon said in verse 17, we cannot understand them. So I called Vernita to pray with Vernita yesterday after hearing the passing of her nephew. She made this statement with a broken heart. Brian, I just don't understand. I just don't understand. Have you ever been there? I've been there. I've been there in life where I, I've wanted to cry out to God and say, God, what is it that you are doing in my life? God, I just don't understand. Please explain it to me. Let me pause for a second that God in his word never promises to give us explanations. He promises that he will be with us each and every moment of life's journey. 
But there's things that we simply will not understand. Romans 11.34 says this, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul quotes Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 13, and he says this, For who can know the Lord's thoughts? And here's the question that some of you might be experiencing today. If you're not experiencing it today, you will at some point in your life. How can we go on when life seems to be falling apart? How do we function when those around us are falling How do we proceed in the midst of pain? Solomon talks about that in the verses that we're studying today. Notice a couple of things that I wrote down in my notes. If you'll follow along, the first thing is this. The events of your life are controlled by God. The the events of your life are controlled by God. I know we've hit that point a few times already in the book of Ecclesiastes, but that is a foundational principle that you and I need to understand, comprehend, and grasp a hold of. God is a sovereign God who is in control. He's in control of your life and mine. And even though it seems at times like our life is spinning out of control, God is in control. God is still on the throne. and God is still orchestrating the events of your life and mine. Verse 1 says this, this too, I carefully explored. Even though the actions of godly and wise people are in God's hands. No one knows whether God will show them favor. The ESV uh, uh, writes it this way, the English Standard Version. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all. How the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. Almost all commentators are in agreement that the term love there is referring to the happy events of life. And the term hate is referring to the unhappy events of life. Uh, All of our life is is a mixed bag. This morning, if I asked you to talk and to think of some of life's happiest events, I'm sure that there are significant moments in your life that stick out that were some of the happiest, the most joyful moments of your life. Then if I asked you to think of life's tragedies, Life's painful moments. I'm sure there's moments in your life that stick out that you immediately think of all of us go through those experiences. Now notice a couple of things that Solomon says. First of all, he says this, your life is out of your hands. Your life is out of your hands. My life is out of my hands. As much as we think we're in control, we're not. Quite frankly today, it doesn't matter if you're a type A personality, a control freak, or a person that is known for getting things done, you are not controlling your life. Now I get it, God allows us to make decisions and God allows us to work and God allows us to provide for our families and do things, but at the end of the day, it's God who's pulling the strings. It is God who is orchestrating the events of your life and mine. The events of your life are out of your hands. The Bible is absolutely filled with examples of people who thought they were controlling their own destiny. People who, who thought that, that, there was, that their success was based upon their ability to do, thing, to, to do things, their, their, their talents and their abilities. Let me mention two. How many remember Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament? Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, and we won't tell the entire story, but Nebuchadnezzar was, was king of Babylon, and one day Nebuchadnezzar goes out and he looks uh, across the whole realm that he had built, and Nebuchadnezzar makes this great statement. He says, look at the great city of Babylon. By my own power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. The text says in verse 31 that while the words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, 
You no longer rule over this kingdom. And in verse 33 of that chapter, it says that God drove him out into the wilderness. Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. Read the chapter, Daniel chapter 4. He ends the chapter eating and grazing like a cow and living like an animal until he comes to the realization that there's a God in heaven. Until he comes to the realization that he is not in control, but God is in control of his life. And when Nebuchadnezzar comes to that realization, God brings him back to humanity and God even allows him to assume his throne again. You see, the events of your life are not in your hands. Luke chapter 2, or excuse me, Luke chapter 12, Jesus gives us the parable of the rich fool. The rich fool looked at everything he had accomplished and said this, I have enough. I can put uh, I have enough to put away and I can retire and rest for the rest of my life. I'm now going to rest, eat, to take a phrase from Ecclesiastes. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20 of that chapter, God said to him, You fool, you will die this very night. You see, church, the simple truth is this. You are not in control of your life. You you may question, well, Brian, if I am not in control, who is in control of my life? Solomon answers that question. In verse 1, once again, he says, the actions of godly and wise people are in God's hands. Here's the idea today. Your life is not in your hands. Your life is in God's hands. Doesn't that sound better this morning? Your life is not in your hands. Your life is in God's hands. Remember the song, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole, you can sing it with me this morning. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. You didn't know you were going to come and sing a 70s song today, did you? Uh, He's got the sun and the moon in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. That's what Solomon is saying. Solomon goes along with the words of Job in Job chapter 12 and verse 10. For the life of every living thing is in his hand. And the breath of every human being. Man, man, church, that is such a strong point for us to understand. Listen, catch this. No one or no thing can undermine God's plan for your life. Sometimes we sit back and when things don't go the way that we want, it's almost like, you know, we're thinking, man, I'm sure God's mad at that person too because that person did something contrary to what God wanted. God wanted me to have this job or God wanted me to have this house or God wanted me to have this child or God wanted me to be well and all of a sudden this person or this situation thwarted what God wanted for my life. Man, that simply is not true. No one or no thing can undermine what God wants to accomplish in your life. He has you in His hands. So it's important for us to realize the events of our lives are controlled by God. There's a second truth that He brings out. The second truth is this. The events of life are shared by everyone. The events of life are shared by everyone. He says in verse 2, the same destiny ultimately awaits everyone. Whether righteous or wicked, good or bad, good people receive the same treatment as sinners, and people who make promises to God are treated like people who don't. Two simple thoughts. Write these down in your notes. The first is this. The same tragedies happen to the righteous and the wicked. The same tragedies happen to the righteous and to the wicked. Just because you're a believer does not mean that you are exempt from the tragedies of life. 
Godly people get sick. Godly people get in car accidents. Godly people get laid off from their jobs. Godly people have disabled kids. Godly people suffer from natural disasters. Godly people lose loved ones. Church, let's not be erroneous in our thinking and think just because we've given our lives to Jesus Christ that all of a sudden no problems are going to happen in our life. You see what happens if we have that mentality and then all of a sudden a problem happens in life, who do we get mad at? We get mad at God as if God was to blame. Listen, tragedies happen because we live in what? We live in a sinful world. Natural disasters happen because we live in a sinful world. On this side of eternity, you and I are going to experience the exact same thing that unbelievers experience. Godly and wicked suffer the same tragedies of life. He mentions a second point there. He says the same fate awaits the righteous and the wicked. Not only do the same tragedies affect the righteous and the wicked, but the same fate awaits the righteous and the wicked. In verse 3 he says this, it seems so wrong that everyone under the sun suffers the same fate. What is that? At the end of the verse, there is nothing ahead but death anyways. What is the fate? The fate is this, everyone will die. Newsflash today. One of these days, you are going to die. One of these days, you're going to die. Everyone suffers the same fate. It doesn't matter if you're a reprobate or you're repentant. If you're a saint or you're a sinner. If you're a crook or you're a clergy. Now, don't go there because some people think they might be the exact same thing, and they're not, right? Everyone will meet the same fate. You can't postpone it. You can't avoid it. You can't reschedule it. You cannot schedule it. And frankly, seldom do you get advance notice. Solomon talked about that in Ecclesiastes 3 too. There's a time to be born. Finish the verse. What does he say in what? A time to die. Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for man to die once. But after this, the judgment. You might sit back today and say, okay, Brian, I'm trying to understand this. I'm trying to wrap my mind around it. If the godly and the ungodly share the same tragedies and the same fate, what is the difference? What's the difference? The difference very simply is this. We are not alone. God is with us each and every step of the way. There's a third point that he brings out. To me, this is somewhat humorous. I know I have a warped sense of humor as I read Scripture, but the third thing that he brings out is this. He says, there are disadvantages to being dead. Now, whether you didn't realize that or not today, let me pause for a second and tell you that there are disadvantages to being dead. That point is somewhat hilarious to me, but in case anyone is thinking that being dead is better than being alive, Solomon points out some rather obvious truths in the passage. The first thing he says is this, the dead know nothing. The dead know nothing. Notice verse 5, the living at least know they will die, but the dead know nothing. Man, The dead can't give fatherly advice. The dead can't help with a homework assignment. They cannot share words of wisdom. Why? They're gone. They passed away. In verse 5, he says, the dead earn nothing. Notice the second phrase of verse 5. But the dead know nothing. They will have no further reward. The dead cannot produce income for their family. Their days of financial provision are over. The third obvious truth that he states is this, the dead share nothing. Whatever they did in their lifetime, loving, hating, envying, spending time with their family, uh, all of that is gone. 
They no longer play a part in anything here on the earth. Solomon is saying is this, once you're gone, your influence upon your family, your influence upon your community, your influence upon your church is done. You no longer play a part. Now, now, now let's pause for just a second because those facts can do one or two things to you this morning. Those facts can either discourage you or they inspire you. Uh, They can either send you into a state of depression or they give you a sense of motivation. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. I want you to catch this yet. The, The point today is not deep. It's simple. Here's the point. You're not dead yet. Can I get a hearty amen this morning? You're not dead yet is what Solomon is saying. You're still alive. There is still time to share what you know. There is still time, guys, to be a godly husband. There is still time to provide for your family. There is still time to make a difference in the world. There's still time to make memories. There is still time to give your life to Jesus. You're not dead yet. What a great truth. As a matter of fact, notice how he says it in verse 4. He says, there is hope only for the living. What a powerful statement. There is hope only for the living. Here's the idea. There is hope while you are still alive. There's a part of verse 3 that we didn't deal with. I kind of bounced off of it because it's, it's uh, very much of a fatalistic thought. But at the end of verse 3, uh, he says this, If we all suffer the same fate, then, why, then that is why people are not more careful to be good. Instead, they choose their own mad course. Why? For they have no uh, hope. You see, here's what Solomon is saying. Life with no hope results in egotism. It leads to fatalism, and eventually it results in agnosticism. You see, when we do not have hope, it gives us a fatalistic mindset. What's the difference then? If we're all going to die, then why not just eat, drink, sin, do whatever I want if we're all going to die anyways? I have no hope. That mentality leads to a selfish mindset. It leads to a fatalistic mindset. And it eventually leads to an agnostic mindset where we turn away from God and we say, well, what does it matter anyways? Solomon gives us a phrase. At the end of verse 4, he says this, it's better to be a live dog than a dead lion. An ancient proverb, obviously dogs were not looked upon with the same favor in ancient times as they're looked upon today. They were looked down upon. The lion was looked at like the king of beasts. And yet Solomon says it's better to be alive, you know, mutt than it is to be a, a dead prince of the jungle. Hey, church, catch this today. While you're alive, there's still hope. Can you do a personal inventory this morning? Would you do that? I'm not talking about the person beside you. I'm not talking about your wife. I'm not talking about your husband. I'm asking you to do a personal inventory today. First of all, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? By that I mean, have have you realized that you're a sinner, that there is nothing that you can do to save yourself, and you realize that Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross for you, is your only hope, and humbly, and in a repentant way, you came to Christ, repented of your sins, and you have turned to Jesus. If you haven't done that yet, there's still time. You're still alive. You can do that. There's still time for you to be a loving Christ-like husband. Husbands, are you living that way? Are you loving your wives as Christ loved the church? If not, there's still time to do that. Are you raising your children the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Are you living for yourself? Are you making a difference in the life of others? 
Here's what Solomon says. Life is brief. Get to know God. Life is brief. Trust God. Life is brief. Serve God. Fanny Crosby said it this way. Only one life. So soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. And I'm afraid so many times, even as believers, we have such an earthly, temporal mindset that we live for life here and we're not living for eternity. Death is a reality of life. There's a corollary truth that goes right along with this point. As we've said Repeatedly, Ecclesiastes is an Old Testament track that points people to none other than Jesus Christ. Here's what we draw from that. Life without Jesus is meaningless. Without Jesus, we have no hope. Without Jesus, we have no hope. John chapter 11, man, I'd encourage you to read this story. It's the, it's the resurrection of Lazarus. Great story where Jesus comes in. And Lazarus, who, by the way, was one of Jesus' best friends, and Lazarus couldn't avoid his appointment with death either. Lazarus died. And Jesus comes, you know the story, comes and calls Lazarus forth out of the tomb. And, 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 and Lazarus is resurrected by the power of Jesus. And Jesus makes this great statement in John eleven twenty five: 25. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. What a great thought. I love that. That's one of my favorite funeral passages. In the beginning of the service, Mark read from 1 Corinthians 15, which is a parallel New Testament passage. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm not going to take the time to read all of it. I would encourage you to go home and read it. 1 Corinthians 15 is a chapter that is so theological. It deals with the significance of the gospel. It deals with the relevance of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. It deals with believers, our future resurrection. It talks about the difference between earthly bodies and heavenly bodies. And it talks about the transformation of our earthly bodies that one day we will be changed and we will receive a heavenly body that now we're just like our first father, Adam. But one day we will be like our second father, Jesus. Jesus Christ, our bodies will be transformed. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15, but he gives three points that I want to close with that, that tie in with this idea that death is a reality of life, but there's still time to trust Jesus. The first is this. It is the resurrection of Jesus that gives substance to our faith. It is the resurrection of Jesus that gives substance to our faith. Verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. Why, why is it that we spend so much time talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Paul says, because without the resurrection, our faith is absolutely worthless. Our preaching, all the religious exercises that we go through without the resurrection of Jesus Christ is worthless. Verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is worth worthless and you are still guilty in your sins. Today, in just a few moments, as we take that bread and we take that cup and we remember what Jesus Christ did for us. We remember that he died, that he shed his blood, that he was buried in a tomb. And three days later, he gloriously rose from the dead. That is the substance of our faith today. It gives foundation to what we believe. Here's the second thing. It is the resurrection of Jesus that gives hope for the future. You see, when Solomon is talking about a hope and we talk about a hope, it's not just an empty hope. It's not, man, one day it's going to get better, a vain, empty hope. It is a hope. It is a trust. It is a faith in someone and what Jesus Christ has done. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, and 20, Paul says, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied, more miserable than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. 
It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives you and I hope for the future. When I stand before you today and I say, I know without any shadow of a doubt that one day I will spend eternity in heaven. How can I make such a bold, audacious statement? It's not because of who I am or what I've done. It's because of who he is and what he has done. The resurrection of Jesus gives hope for the future. And the last is this, the resurrection of Jesus that gives victory over sin. It's what gives us victory over death. Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And he goes through and says that it is Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus that gives us victory over death. So even though this morning we talk about the fact that death is a reality of life, and physically every single one of us have an appointment with death, and I hope yours, like mine, is a long ways off. And yet we realize that because Jesus died and rose from the dead, he will give us life even after dying. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives victory over death. 